My guest today is Sharon Woods, the director of the Hosting and Compute Center at the Defense Information Systems Agency. Sharon, welcome back to the DoD Cloud Exchange. Great to have you back for a second year in a row. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Jason. It's always great to talk. There's so much to talk about, and, and I think uh, what the hack is doing through DISA is uh, right in the front and center of everything around DoD, the cloud. So let's jump right in. Uh, last year, you talked about the hack as being a quote unquote provider of choice for DoD organizations when it comes to cloud and hybrid environments. Let's get an update. How have you been pursuing that goal? What, what's changed over the last year? Yeah, so we are really focused on being the provider of choice for hosting and compute. And I think being the best value provider uh, really is comprised of three components. And that's the way we've been thinking about it. Uh, the first is prioritizing the customer and their mission. We can't get into some of that traditional mindset where you know, we receive requirements from the customer, but then we don't talk to them again until we've developed a product and hand it back. Uh, and a lot of times the product ends up diverging from what the customer really needs. So we're following agile methodologies where you know, we receive the requirements and we are continuously interacting with customers getting that you know, user feedback loop so that you know, we're understanding not just what their mission is, but what is it that they need because they don't have it today. Uh, and part of that user feedback loop lets us prioritize their requirements uh, so that the capabilities being delivered are matching what they need. And, and with you know, everything going on in today's environment, it's really important that we're delivering at speed and getting them the capabilities that they need. Uh, the second component is optionality. Uh, there is no such thing as a one size fits all solution. The department's mission is vast and there's a lot of diversity in the different missions across the military services and, and the uh, combatant commands and DOD components. And so, you know, we're a, a honest broker. We provide hosting and compute across all platforms, uh, data center, private cloud, and commercial cloud. And so we are in a position to provide guidance and recommendations on what kind of platform might best meet the requirements of the customer. And then finally, we have to make it easy to adopt hybrid cloud. And I want to make a distinction there. You know, I say hybrid cloud because that's really today's world of hybrid capabilities. It isn't just one platform over another, but it's not enough to develop a capability and just throw it over the fence and say, hey, you know, here's hosting and compute, good luck. We have to be thinking about the ordering process, the provisioning process, and even just how we do technical exchanges and make ourselves available to the customers. So for us, best value is prioritizing the customer, it's providing optionality, and it's making it easy to adopt hybrid cloud. Each of those three just seem very, of course you do this. Why wouldn't you do this, right? This is a service provider. How much different is it than what you're trying to kind of uh, establish institutionalized and what this has done in the past, or is it just, of course, this is what we've always done, but now when it comes to cloud, things must be a little different because of the speed, the agility, the flexibility that's needed. Yeah. So I think this, uh, you know, has always been customer centric, um, because it is a service provider, but I think that transition from waterfall engineering and development to more agile methodologies changed the way we're interacting with customers. You know, I had mentioned, you know, a key element to agile is not just receiving requirements, but having the user be a part of the development process. And it fundamentally changes the conversation. Uh, you know, historically, uh, you know, sometimes we have treated information technology programs like it's shipbuilding or like it's weapon system building. Right, and that can take years to do. Uh, and by the time you get to the end of a one or two year period of time, if we're not continuously engaging with the user, the requirements and the way we've addressed them and that final product that comes out at the other end, it tends to not really address the user's needs in all the ways that they imagined. And it's very hard to go back and start you know, start again. And so I think it's more around 
shifting how we're engaging with the customer. And that's why that user experience too around provisioning and ordering and you know, what does it look like to, to interact with the front end of an application, for instance? Uh, you know, how hard is it for a user to sign into something um, and, and looking at things like single sign-on? I think the user experience has just taken on a role that's front and center as opposed to ancillary. I'm glad you brought up user experience. We hear a lot about customer experience. We hear a lot about that internal customer versus the external customer. And for DISA, the internal is your external and your external is your internal customer. Let's maybe talk good on that path a little bit. How is that? How are you implementing this agile approach? I, I know, uh, I think we'll talk in, in a little bit about DevSecOps as well as part of the Vulcan mm -hmm. platform, but let's start with maybe the 50,000 foot view of how is agile really getting more integrated into how you are delivering, providing services, ensuring that folks, if you will, get what they want. So one of the most, I think, critical dimensions to Agile is speed. And, and that doesn't mean just being sloppy, right, and moving through a process without discipline. In fact, there's quite a bit of discipline that goes into the ceremonies um, and activities around an Agile process. Um, but it's scoping what you're delivering so that you are delivering something quickly. Within the hack, we focus on uh, getting from here's an idea to delivering a minimum viable product in six months or less. And a great example of that is infrastructure as code, you know, where you can create baselines to set up cloud environments rather than taking weeks, if not months, to kind of manually do that. It does get more towards you know, push a button and within two to four hours, you have your basic cloud environment up and now you can focus on your mission. So we developed the baselines, but then there are different capabilities that you can prioritize. And rather than imagining those, you know, we were interacting with our customers and taking their demand in consideration. So originally we did this with two cloud providers, but then we added a third and we're in the process of adding a fourth because of that feedback. We got feedback that not just on classified was important, but classified infrastructure as code was important as well. So I think you know, we could have taken right that traditional approach of imagining what is most important, but instead of doing that, we said, what is the user you know, actually saying? And, and really the nexus there is what is the mission driving towards? And, and I think that's another differentiator. If we're not just developing technology, we're fundamentally supporting the warfighter and all the supporting elements on, on meeting you know, the mission and the current environment is very pressurized. And so those six month iterations and moving at speed is really important. I wanna definitely talk more about infrastructure as code, but it's interesting, you said you had two cloud providers, you added a third, now you're, you're gonna add a fourth. And also in the classified world, is the fourth per, fourth provider in the classified world or, or of the four, some, because a lot of the providers are both classified, mm -hmm. unclassified, you're just kind of, you said to, hey, Google, Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, whomever, well, we'll we want also your classified uh, cloud. Is, is that basically what happened or, or did you purposefully look at that classified cloud? So we started right with one cloud vendor and that vendor was a little bit more mature in some of the platform offerings that are necessary to do the infrastructure's code product that we put together, um, as well as the second one. And then we're adding a third, you know, we added the third and we're in the process of adding the fourth. So we kind of went back to that first cloud vendor that was a little bit more mature in their platform offerings. And that's what we lifted into the classified environment. Um, but all of the, um, you know, the four hyperscale vendors that we're working with on JWCC, for instance, right, Amazon and Microsoft and Google and Oracle, all four of them operate in both the unclassified and the secret space. So I think it's just a matter of time before we're in a position to roll that out for all four. And as we talk about this infrastructure as code, what does that really mean? You, you talked about the speed and the ability to say, hey, if I need a cloud uh, instance, I can turn it up. But a lot of people talked about that in the, you know, 10, five, seven years ago is virtualization. Oh, well, just turn up a virtual box and now you have a, a cloud, right? 
this is similar, different. How, how, put a maybe finer point on what you mean by infrastructure as code. Yeah, so it's it's more than just turning on a virtual machine for sure. Uh, when you set up the initial cloud environments, right, you're getting some of the basic security policies uh, that that are necessary, and that one's a really important one. And and what we've done with the project is get those controls, you know, that that are part of those security policies pre-accredited and they're pre-configured. And so by getting them pre-configured uh, and pre-accredited in particular, now the mission owner, you know, the customer, they're inheriting those controls. So rather than having to get an accreditation for 300 plus controls on their own, they're able to inherit a very substantial percentage of those and only have to focus on the delta that is unique to their application. I would also say too that infrastructure as code is the beginning, right, of an element to a, a DevSecOps pipeline. There's different components to DevSecOps, um, and I, you know, we can talk about that too. Uh, but I think infrastructure as code and the idea of that automation, the pre-configuration, um, the consistency. Uh, and automation around setting up those environments, right? Those are a lot of the um, basic tenants behind a DevSecOps uh, operation. And roughly, I know infrastructure as code, you reminded us when that launched, was it been about a year, or maybe a little bit over a year? And then what, what's the usage like? How are, have you been through the kind of that first iteration of users and started to say, okay, how can we do this better? How can we continue to improve it? Yeah, so it was something that we did over a year ago, and we did hit that six-month target. Uh, you know, we had pilot users to start. At this point, we have dozens of users, uh, which is fantastic, and we're just working on scaling it. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing is focusing, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, to be a full-service provider, one of the things you need to look at is uh, integration services. And so, you know, one of the pieces of that is, you know, again, and I mentioned this before, not just saying, hey, infrastructure as code is available, but helping uh, customers actually adopt infrastructure as code by providing them support. So I think that's an important element to scaling it because not everybody is mature enough to just ingest infrastructure as code on their own. One of the pieces to this that let's go down this path a little bit, and, and you mentioned JWCC, and I know a lot of folks who are tuning in probably want to hear you talk about the latest of JWCC, but we'll make them wait just a little bit longer because I think the, the more logical piece to go is this idea of the cloud broker. And you mentioned uh, this mm -hmm. idea of customer experience, ensuring that folks aren't just throwing the, the requirements over the transom and, and coming back a year later. There's a whole mm -hmm. piece to this. So I want to talk about the hybrid cloud br broker and let's start. What is it, how it works, and then how is this part of this customer experience uh, effort that you've been going through? Yeah, so our hybrid cloud broker is the single point of entry for customers so that they understand where to go. And I, I do want to make a note, the name hybrid cloud broker, and I kind of underline hybrid, was very deliberate because I think in other instances in, in federal government, you know, it's a cloud broker. And I think that's a little misleading because it isn't just commercial cloud. There are people in private cloud, there are people in traditional data centers and, you know, calling it a hybrid cloud broker, I think signals the idea that there are multiple platforms. And as an honest broker, we are here to help you understand which environments may be the best in order to meet your requirements. Uh, so the hybrid cloud broker is 100% customer centric. You know, it exists for the customer. And I think there is a customer to human element to that, and then a customer to technology element to that. Um, so from a human perspective, right, we're responding to customers in less than 24 hours. That's one of our commitments. Uh, we are the liaison for them between different technical arms in our organization, because how are they supposed to know what engineer to go talk to in order to get more detail? Um, so we do do technical exchanges. We are that, you know, serving as that liaison or helping them just understand what capabilities exist and talking through their requirements. And a lot of times customers haven't 
fully baked out the requirements. And so by us being able to describe what's out there to meet their challenges, right? To say, well, what's your challenge? And then we can kind of meet in the middle about, well, what would make sense as a series of requirements to solve your problem. Uh, I think the, you know, that is huge in elevating the experience for customers. Um, another piece to this is uh, the hybrid cloud broker also is supported by a customer relationship management tool, a CRM. That is so important because you don't want to lose all the human to human interaction that's happening. Uh, and, and then it ends up becoming anecdotal, right? No one knows who talked to who. And by using a CRM, we can aggregate information by customer, by interest in a particular product, by particular issues that keep coming up. We're able to share that information across anybody in the hybrid cloud broker or some of our technical folks that need to understand what those conversations are, right? You can pull in documents, we can pull in the requirements documents. Um, they're really powerful tools so that you know, we have uh, historical knowledge and then can make these projections around, hey, based on all of these demand signals, this is what's coalescing this is what may make sense for the future. But then I go back to Agile. We're not just imagining what that is based on a few data points and then moving out, right? We're connecting with uh, a community of users to see if what we're projecting does in fact make sense for what they're, they're thinking. So, so the hybrid cloud broker is that single point of entry and it is a, a human to human enduring customer relationships as well as supporting all of that with an underlying CRM tool. I think the key here, as you said, is not just the fact you're saying the word it's hybrid, there's multiple platforms and sometimes that gets lost in the discussion because this is still has the, has the hybrid cloud, you have Stratus and mm -hmm. I'm sure you still have some data centers. There's some okay. one or two data centers left out there that you still, hey, this we have to keep this kind of tighter or at least closer. What's the, some of those trends that have emerged as, as the people have come to cloud brokers and uh, your cloud broker effort to say, hey, we need what? Or do, do, do you also find that? I think it's a two part question here. Hey, some people say we got to stay in the DISA deck. So we got to stay on the data centers. Mm -hmm. and, and they go, oh, I didn't realize I could go to the cloud. What are some of those trends you're seeing? So we're seeing a few different trends. One of them is that for Stratus, right, our private cloud environment. And so that's a cloud environment, but within the DISA, uh, the DISA data centers. And it is, you know, does have some of those cloud characteristics, automation and, and self-provisioning and utility billing. Um, we're seeing an increased demand for secret Stratus. And so we have an accredited secret environment, um, but, there's more and more a focus on some of the command and control mission. And you see that in the department with its JADC2 initiatives and wanting to better integrate all the different C2 applications across services, across components, across combatant commands. Um, so secret status is something that we're seeing an increased demand for. Um, another one is DevSecOps. Uh, and, and that goes back to folks want to adopt the cloud um, and some of them have just been told and they don't necessarily understand what that means. And so DevSecOps, right, it provides them the, the automation and some of the quick starting uh, in order to develop their applications and get to a place where more quickly their applications are in production and they're able to capitalize and use that data. Um, the other demand that we're seeing is Oconus Cloud, right, cloud that isn't uh, in the United States uh, hosted there, but overseas, including places like Hawaii. Um, the department's mission is global. Uh, the warfighter operates in pretty austere environments sometimes. And so you can't assume connections are going to be reliable and persistent. Um, so we're seeing a lot of demand for Oconus Cloud. And, and interesting on that point, um, the data centers overseas, I think, have a different place than data centers within the uh, United States. And I say that because you cannot assume persistent connection. Those environments can become completely isolated and the entire land masses, right? I mean, Hawaii itself could become isolated. 
they need access to their data and applications locally in a way that doesn't assume there's a transatlantic or trans-Pacific connection because data sovereignty forces us to use the cloud commercial data centers in the United States only. So you're having to haul back and do that reach back. So, um, and I'm not saying they can't move into a cloud environment. That's part of what we're trying to do is fill that space for OCONUS cloud requirements. But that does, it's a different narrative OCONUS when it comes to the data centers Sharon, I, I'm glad you brought up the Oconus Cloud. I know the Army at one point had did a pilot into into a Pacific region. I, if I remember correctly, I think you guys worked with them on that, or were you? Uh, did you? Or at the very least, I'm sure you were aware of it and paid attention to it. Were there any specific lessons or, or anything that you pulled from that to say, okay, this gives us a better idea of how to make this Oconus Cloud work even better? Well, I think the Army use cases, you know, they're still they're still working through that, and they're very tactical, which right makes sense for the mission. Um, it, Oconus Cloud, you know, we're approaching it with three layers. Uh, there's that strategic core cloud, and that's in the United States. It assumes persistent, you know, quality connection. Um, that's that's not Oconus Cloud, right? That that's the layer that's in the United States. The next is operational, where it is applications and data closer to the user overseas. It still may assume at that management plane level, reach back to the United States. But there's a huge user benefit because the application and data, you're not having to backhaul all the way to the United States. It's there where you are. And so that's improving the user experience. That's an area where we have been focusing and then there's the tactical edge uh, layer where there is no connection or you can't uh, rely on the connection. It may be latent, it, it may be inconsistent. And so there are different technologies that the commercial cloud providers offer that really target the tactical edge layer. Um, so I think you know the army has been focusing on a number of tactical edge we right now are focusing on on that operational layer with an eye towards tactical edge as well. And again, I'll just go back to, we're gonna talk about GWCC because you talked about operational and talked about tactical. Mm -hmm. These are all the key words we hear about it. Uh, one last question around uh, your cloud efforts because you mentioned Oconus, you mentioned secret. And I think the demand for secret is, is a, also another interesting trend that you highlighted because it shows that there's a growing comfort with the use of cloud computing do you understand it that way too what, what why do you would why do you think that there is this interest in the secret cloud why is that demand increasing yeah so I, I think more and more the mission and again in this environment things are so pressurized it's clear that we have to be able to best leverage our data and use really powerful tools like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And you just don't get that with non-cloud platforms. And so out of necessity to a degree, mission partners need, uh, customers need access to cloud, but they're, you know, the combatant commands, they live in secret. Um, and, and you can imagine why, you know, why that, that may be. And so it has to be secret cloud. So I think some of it is out of necessity, but then I also think that there were some leaders in this area, um, especially in some of the special operations community that really proved uh, that this is possible and that this can be secure uh, and this, this can make sense. Is this getting to secret there's also the next layer, top secret. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's TCA, uh, TSCI. Is that a place you'd like to go to, whether it's a year from now or five years from now? Yes. Uh, and I think the intelligence community was really the leader in this area with their C2E. Uh, and prior to that, you know, C2S contracts. Uh, and, and so that's great, right? Because they've laid a lot of groundwork for us and again, proven that it is absolutely uh, possible. Under JWCC, 
uh, we're looking at rolling out top secret in early to late summer because uh, some of the exist, you know, some of those cloud vendors already have provisional authorizations with the intelligence community. And so it's just a matter of uh, threading the needle with reciprocity and making sure they're able to meet our uh, particular requirements. Um, so I, I think top secret is coming uh, and there is a demand for top secret uh, because, you know, you get tactical data from the warfighter, but then there is intelligence data that we may be getting, you know, from other agencies. Um, and, and the marriage of those two things oftentimes is in the top secret world. And so while we may on a day-to-day -day basis operate in secret, once you start pulling in some of the intelligence components, you really need to be in a top secret environment. All right, let's jump in. You mentioned JWCC. You give okay. us maybe a little bit of a tidbit that's uh, coming later this summer. So uh, let's start. What is the status of the joint warfighting cloud capability? A lot of focus on it. You made that contract award. You finally got out from under the old name. We won't even mention it, Sharon. So where are we with JWCC? Give us an update. Yeah, so we're building acquisition packages with customers right now. Uh, and you know, we had developed a tool to, it's almost like a wizard of, hey, you need a statement of work and you, you need to define your requirement and what are your evaluation criteria. So we wanted to get out of that manual process where you're emailing documents around and configuration control is just a nightmare. Um, so we've created this almost like TurboTax experience just to put the package together, um, just to get the documents together. Uh, and so that's what we're doing right now. Folks are getting their funding documents cut and so I think in the coming weeks, we will see the first um, awarded task orders, but there is a little bit of upfront work to get the acquisition package together and get through an evaluation process. So we're really close on those first task orders. It also took um, you know, about 30 days or so just to get the contractors up to speed, right? There's just things you have to do with contract kickoff, with looking at you know, seed rules for folks that have to deal with those. Uh, where you, you just need to make sure that everything's squared away contractually. Um, so we, we, are, uh, we are in a position to offer secret. The provisional authorizations are already in place for some of the cloud vendors. And I think it's just doing that final legwork of connecting the ordering process for it. And then top secret, like I mentioned, uh, we're looking at early to late summer to making that available um, and with JWCC, you know, especially because we're, you know, we're seeing the increased demand for Oconus Cloud, we're focused on Oconus Cloud, there's a lot of opportunity with JWCC to capitalize on the different edge capabilities, edge compute that the cloud vendors provide in order to fill those requirements for the department. What kind of demand are you starting to see for JWCC initially? Are you how many calls are you having? How much interest are you? Have you been doing a ton of educational sessions? Because I think one of the big concerns was because this took so long to get together, not just JWCC, but because of the predecessor's challenges, that a lot of folks have already moved out, right? You have Air Force Platform One, Cloud One, Army has ECMA. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that the Navy has, you know. Uh, Project Flank Speed and a and bunch of other kind of very fun names like that. So they've all kind of already moved out into the cloud. So how much how much education are you doing versus how much are people coming to you saying, we want to get it, we have a task order ready for JWCC? Yeah, so so we it's actually been a great challenge to have. We've had, uh, for instance, over a three-way period of time, I mean, dozens of interactions. And so we've had to surge in order to uh, meet that demand of, hey, this is what JWCC has to offer. This is why it's a benefit to you. You know, while the military services, um, you know, have moved out in some different areas, uh, you know, the combatant commands uh, are still in great need. Some of the um, supporting components, right? You look at DFAS or DITRA or DLA, right? There's a whole list of acronyms um, of other DOD components where they're directly supporting the warfighter and, and they have great need. Uh, and so we're seeing great demand for JWCC uh, and it's, it's been fantastic to see. Uh, and, and so we're excited. We're, we're really excited about the demand that we're seeing. Is there any, 
in terms of JWC, you said the first task orders uh, hopefully be awarded soon. I'm not sure how much you can talk about it because I do understand there's some sensitivities there. But do you expect, generally speaking, all four of the awardees to bid on every task order? Or again, with anything else, who really mm -hmm. knows? Because it could be something that Microsoft and Oracle are really great at and AWS may not play in as much. I mean, how do you see it kind of working through in this just early, early uh, part so far? Yeah, and I think you you just hit the nail on the head is that they're the four cloud vendors that we have on JWCC, they're not identical, right? They have different specialties and each offer different advantages over another. There's also different degrees of familiarity within the, the department with the cloud vendors. And so part of what um, is actually provided under the contract is education, uh, training, and so you know, maybe uh, a, a customer has less familiarity with one of the cloud vendors, but they're able to access training and advisory services to help fill that gap. And so the task orders are made available to all four vendors to compete. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that all four can best meet that requirement. And we have different pathways to do those competitions uh, our, our benchmark is, um, you know, 60 days or less. And some of the different ways you can compete are quicker than that, right? Really fall more on the under 30 day, uh, which when you look at competing task orders against a multiple award contract, more often than not, that takes over a year um, or at least a year for other contracts to do. And so we got as creative as possible with JWCC uh, so that we could meet the demand quickly. At one point, and, and I know it's probably a year ago, probably at the last DoD Cloud Exchange, maybe mm -hmm. even before that, one of the things that we know DoD talked about, and this is maybe something for uh, the DoD CIO's office versus your office, but I'll, I'll just throw it out there for you and see if you could maybe offer a little light on it. There was maybe not going to be necessarily specific competitions, but more of, hey, this need goes to this vendor. Hey, okay, that need goes to that vendor. Kind of more of the, you know, we're going to divvy it up based on, the requirements, it seems the DOD uh, shifted to say, no, we're going to be more traditional in the task order, but it sounds like you're going to find some hybrid where we're going to be uh, getting this out through uh, through task orders. You can do it much more quickly than just a typical like, oh, I'm going to go to the GSA schedule and that could be quick as a day and it could be months and months. Right. Um, there are different use cases and this is something that maybe um, we didn't necessarily appreciate when we put things in place is that, you know, there are folks with a lot of existing task orders, I think on other contracts. And I think we all knew that. What we didn't necessarily realize was the scale of that, right? I know a customer that has a hundred different task orders under other contracts and that's, that's huge but they want to come to JWCC. And that is uh, where I, it's exciting because uh, they see JWCC as that centralized push button premier enterprise contract. And so they are coming to us to say, hey, I have this other task order on another contract, but I want to come to JWCC. And it isn't just always, hey, I have this vendor. And so I want to keep this vendor. They're also additional demand for, I, I want to start looking at other vendors, right? I need to be multi-cloud. And so while I started with one particular vendor, I actually want to expand to other vendors, especially in specialty areas, particular tactical edge devices, particular kind of machine learning capabilities at the platform layer. Uh, so, so some of the demand signals, um, it isn't just people that have never done cloud before. We're seeing a mix. Is there any concern from your perspective at the hack that you could be overwhelmed by the uh, excitement over JWCC? I mean, because the, one of the big concerns on any big contract is, okay, we only have four vendors. What if you get, and I'll make this up, right? A hundred task orders on April 1st or a hundred task orders, you know, all of a sudden by May 1st, that, you know, it's, they're all of a sudden the 60 day, like you're trying to get those out the door and people get frustrated. Like there's this, effect that you have to kind of balance. Uh, is, there, is, is that something that you all have taken, obviously I'm sure have thought about, but how have you guarded against it? Yeah, so it's definitely something we thought about and it's a challenge that I welcome. 
that that is where I want to be on that side of the scale. Uh, but we do have a few benefits for us, right? That that is actually why one of the reasons why uh, we stood up the hybrid cloud broker a few months ago was we needed an entry point or the program office would get overwhelmed by all the demand signal, right? Their, their focus has to be implementing the contracts and making sure performance uh, is occurring the way that is envisioned in the contract. Uh, that's different than, than all that customer engagement and helping people understand what's on the contract and facilitating their onboarding and, and the task order process. So that is one of the reasons why we stood up the hybrid cloud broker and uh, it is something that is elastic, right? I can add folks into the hybrid cloud broker and surge them. Uh, and so that gives me some flexibility there. So that's, that's one piece to it. The other piece to it is the automation I mentioned before. Um, there is in a lot of other contracts, this lead time of just putting together the acquisition package itself. And so we spent some time uh, working with the contracting office in DISA so that they were really driving uh, how do we be creative but make sure we're checking the right boxes from an acquisition regulation standpoint. How do we automate it so that it, it's more like a wizard? You know, hey, I want a task order. I need to put these basic documents together. We automated that process. And so that is also a way that I think we've accomplished speed. So what we're doing a lot of times is we'll pull multiple customers together and give them a demonstration of how the tool works. And then they're off and running on their own. We've seen with, for instance, other big contracts like this, there's a government wide acquisition contract at NASA called soup and they do something called procurement delegation authority. Is that an, even an option? Could I, if I'm at the army or DLA or wherever, go to JWC and just take care of my own task order? And if I'm looking for something maybe fairly straightforward, is, is that an option? Absolutely. Yeah. So while it is a enterprise contract, it allows for decentralized ordering. So you do not have to use um, a contracting officer at DISA in order to place an order off the contract. We're putting together um, an ordering guide and templates um, and things like that, so that if the Army wants to bring their own contracting officer, if Indopaycom wants to use their own contracting officer, you know, they can do that. And that is one of the ways, you know, we can accommodate customer demand as well. And it's also a way that we give them control and flexibility over their own requirements. You know, JWCC was never about pigeonholing people. It was about optionality and having multi-vendor and giving folks an opportunity um, to take the reins on their cloud requirements. And so letting folks kind of bring your own contracting officer style uh, is, is one of the ways that we're enabling that, that optionality and the flexibility. Sharon, I know there's a lot more to talk about JWCC and it's gonna to continue to go, but so one last question, and then we're gonna move on to a few other of your priorities. When you look at JWC, how are you gonna measure really success? So you talked about time to award, 60 days, hopefully, or, or even 30 days or less. You talked about this idea of, you know, you know, the usage. Is there is there another way that you're looking at it beyond kind of some, some of those more straightforward metrics that says, okay, this has been successful because there's, again, a lot of concern over the last year, year and a half that, hey, if this was done in 2018 or 2017 when that yet to be mentioned name uh, was put out there. <laughs> Uh, you'd be in much better shape than you are here in 2023. So what's what's your metric? What are you hoping to say? Hey, this is this is now, this is, I can say, a success. So uh, as you can imagine, we're looking at dollar value is going to be one of the metrics. I think numbers of customers, regardless of dollar value, is also another thing we're looking at because I, I think it's important that this works for different DOD components, different combatant commands that, um, that we don't get in this place where it's only working for one particular segment of the DOD landscape. So diversity of customers, uh, amount, uh, number of task orders, but then also uh, how is this benefiting the mission? And so again, because of the agile methodologies that we're using and just that customer first uh, mindset that we have, uh, you know, we're working so closely with customers where they're able to say, this is how I'm doing it today. Um, I'm in this data center uh, and, and these are some of my challenges. 
they get into cloud. And now we can say, well, what benefit are you getting from that? You know, we saw that with infrastructure as code where we had a customer that was taking 38 weeks just to build their cloud environment. And now it takes them two to four hours. And so, you know, I, I don't know what, what exact performance metrics we're going to see emerge that has to really be driven by the customer, but we're going to be tracking that as well. And that also puts us in a position to come up with vignettes, to come up with user stories for other customers so that they can see, oh, hey, this other combatant command did something and this was the benefit that they got. And so, you know, let me give it a shot and maybe I can get that same benefit too. All right. Uh, I appreciate that because I think one of the things that the big concern is, okay, will people act, you know, you've built it, will they come? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you, you're starting to see a lot of interest already. So now the now it's all, uh, all the pressures on DISA and your folks to mm -hmm. obviously continue to deliver. And speaking of delivery, uh, good segue to talk a little bit about Stratus. I brought that up pre previously. This is the uh, private cloud replacement for the old mill cloud 2.0. Give me an update on Stratus. Where are we today and, and how's it going to continue to evolve? Yeah, so so Stratus is our private cloud environment, and just like you said, you know we sunset Mill Cloud 2.0 last year, and in less than six months, again I'll mention that time frame, we stood up our new capability, and about two thirds of the customers from Mill Cloud to IaaS transitioned over to Stratus, which was great to see. Some of the customers were ready for commercial cloud, and I think that's fantastic. And I go back to we're an honest broker. If they're ready to go to commercial cloud you know, go to commercial cloud. I'm not trying to make you, you know, stuck or, or, you know, I'm not predisposed to any particular platform. I offered them all. And so uh, that's one thing we've seen with Stratus. Uh, another was that, you know, we are seeing this increased demand for secret. Um, we're also seeing folks just, you know, have more and more data. So they may have already been in there, but their data footprint is expanding, which is good to see. And one of the things that we did, uh, you know, recently was implement utility billing um, and right, I said before, we need to be a best value provider. Well, this goes directly toward that because uh, customers on average have seen a 14% savings by implementing utility billing as opposed to that allocation model where you're having to pay um, for all of your potential capacity, even if you're only using a portion of it. With utility billing, you're only paying for what you're using. And we're seeing that cost savings for the customers, which really shows hey, Stratus really is a best value proposition. The utility billing approach has been really a tough nut to crack for a lot of agencies when it comes to the cloud. Can you just talk a little bit about how you're doing it? Because the way agencies are funded is you're getting a lump, a lump of money, never right. by October 1, but by <laughs> November, December, January. <laughs> yeah, not and then, October. <laughs> and, then, and then you have to spend it. And a lot of times it's a guess. So how, how is your approach? How does your approach work? So, you know, we, you start with, hey, if we were doing allocation, what would be the top out amounts, right? That, that just gives you a data point. Um, for our customers that are in Stratus already, you know, they're seeing the cost savings. And so they're seeing that Delta. So we're already working with them to say, you know what, for your next task order, I think you can use less. We're also taking some of those lessons learned and we're explaining that to customers that, you know, this is actually how this billing works. Um, and, you know, some customers, they do end up with um, unexpended money at the end, which they can now reinvest in other capability. Um, so it's not, you know, necessarily a bad thing, but you always want to be kind of predicting what is the more realistic amount of funding that we need. So we are, uh, you know, we just implemented it. So there's, there's going to be a learning curve for us and for customers, but we're tracking it really closely and working with each of them directly to make sure they're getting what they need. I think that's something a lot of other agencies will want to beg, bar, and steal from that. So I think that's it's interesting that one you're you're going down that path, but two you've uh, it's kind of new from uh, for Stratus and what this is doing. So I'm sure it's something we'll want to follow up with you a little bit later on. A couple other quick uh, hits here. Uh, another big service that you've launched in the last uh, a couple uh, months or last year or so is container as a service. Let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how this kind of falls into that agile DevSecOps approach to really help get the missionaries, the warfighters, more capabilities more quickly. Yeah, so 
Containers as a service uh, was, it is an example of hybrid to its core because containers are most associated with cloud. And our proposition was that, you know, some folks just aren't ready to move out of the data center yet, but that doesn't mean they can't capitalize on modern technology. So we took containers and brought them into the data centers. We did it for web servers to start and that's allowing those data center customers to begin modernizing and start having experience with cloud-like technology. One of the things we're finding is that a lot of customers don't know what a container is, right? Or, or you know, that term gets thrown around so much and I'd be really curious to see how many folks could explain what a container is. So I'll use an analogy uh, and this is some of the benefit you get with containers as a service. Uh, so just think about, I have a product that needs to be manufactured. And one way I could do that is go by the building. I could staff up the labor. I could do all the electricity myself. I could find all the manufacturing equipment and do all of that myself, maintain it all myself and, and, and have to, uh, you know, deal with each of those things desperately on its own. Um, that is what I'll say is the, the traditional model and standing up a web server in a data center, right? You have to take the server, you have to load all these things, you have to configure this and configure that, and you have the operating system and, right? It's just, it's a big footprint of things you have to do. With, you know, going back to the manufacturing analogy, you know, instead of doing that, I can go find a building that is already set up to manufacture my product, right? They, they already have everything in place. And so all I'm doing is saying, this is the product that I need, these are the components that it's comprised of. And so, you know, kind of out comes your product and it's packaged for you as opposed to having to do it all on your own and all the overhead associated with doing it all on your own, right? Because we're offering a managed service that's containerized. And so for the applications themselves, there's this um, you know, wrap around where a bunch of things are being abstracted too. So rather than um, the example I like to give is an operating system. You know, when you need to do an update or go to the next operating system under the traditional model, a lot of times there's an outage period where you can't access your application at all. With a container, it's so easy to set up another container because it's so automated with the new upgrade. And then you move right into that new updated version and you just blow away the old one, but there's no downtime. And that's huge for customers to not have to, you know, worry about the downtime in order to get to the next version. And a lot of times that's a big barrier to adopting new technology is I don't have time for a downtime. And so you get kind of stuck on old versions. And I think containers really start to change that narrative. And containers can be used by not just people who have legacy that's stuck in data centers, but really anybody. We, we hear about this mm -hmm. all the time, Kubernetes and, and other types oh, of yeah. containerization. If you want to use it in the cloud for that same reason, if you know you have uh, a application that you're going to have to uh, big surge of usage and you want to mm -hmm. extend the compute, but then you know that surge will end, you can bring it down. I, I imagine containers could, could work in that world too. Absolutely. And you know, again, that's right. Containers are most in Kubernetes and all the most associated with commercial cloud environments. Um, and that's just, uh, you know, that's where the benefit is proven. And so that was our proposition is, right, how do we get that benefit to customers that are in the data center? All right, Sharon, we're just about out of time, but, but I just want to give you maybe uh, a minute or so to talk real quick about Vulkan. We talked about that, DevSecOps, Agile, take us all the way back to the beginning of our conversation about that, that customer focus uh, that this uh, and that hack is having. Uh, quickly, what is Vulkan and, and then any kind of update you want to provide around that effort? So Vulkan is our DevSecOps uh, project, and we're thinking about it in two phases. The first is just the basic tooling that folks use in order to move towards DevSecOps. So think about, uh, you know, GitLab, you, you know, Jira, Confluence, and, and the like. And then the next phase is really merging those things together to start creating pipelines for certain types of applications. We have seen a really, we have about 2,500 users in our uh, git.mil instance where code is being hosted, which is a, a huge demand signal. And we're in the process now of piloting um, the JIRA piece of this. And we have a wait list 
of pilot customers because we can only do so many beta customers at once. And so the demand signal is there's been an explosion with that. And, and one of the things we're doing that I think is different than other DevSecOps projects is that we're meeting customers where they are. More mature customers may just want the tools and they want to do their own pipelines. Other customers are not as mature and they need not just the tools, but they need us to do the pipeline and give, up, give them you know, the, the underlying foundation for the pipeline itself. So uh, Vulcan is continuing to evolve. We're using that agile process, prioritizing based on customer demand. And you know, it's, it's been a really awesome project. All right, Sharon, I, we could talk probably another uh, 50 minutes or so, but unfortunately we're gonna have to let you go, go back to your day and, and uh, move on with the DoD Cloud Exchange. So let me thank my guest. Sharon Woods is the director of the Hosting and Compute Center at the Defense Information Systems Agency. Sharon, always a pleasure. Thank you uh, for sharing everything that's going on. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. My pleasure. And I'm Jason Miller. Now let me send you back to the studio for more from the DoD Cloud Exchange on Federal News Network.